So, uh, John, I wanted to just start with um, a question about how you came to meet Lale and, and know the Kara people. Were you working in the region, or did they reach out to you? You know, I was uh, first drawn to the Omo Valley uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, I was, I, I started off uh, early loving photography. In the Navy, I was a photographer. In fact, I, I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. Uh, as my career, uh, being in the Navy making documentaries. I ended up spending 25 years instead of making video games, or running studios and made video games. And um, I decided that when video photography came, came about, I wanted to go back to what my passion is, which is photography and, and photographing people, and traveling to uh, interesting cultures, exploring great places. And um, I, I learned about this place, the Omo Valley, a place in National Geographic called The Last Frontier in Africa. I was fascinated by it. And I went there. And Lolly was 20 years old. Um, he was 21 at the time. And he was working for my guide. And he spoke English, and we, we became friends. And he, he hung with me as we would travel, as I would photograph people, meet people. He'd explain the culture, explain the people. And uh, I was fascinated by it. I loved it. And I wanted to go back. I wanted to learn more. I never knew about Navy. That was never talked about. It was taboo. It was never discussed just with outsiders. And uh, for five years, I kept going back and getting to know these folks. And after a while, they, they were comfortable with me. They knew me. I'd bring coffee, I'd bring corn, whatever they, they would need, maybe a little bit of medical help. And uh, it was after five years of my photography that I thought, you know, my work, my body of work here is just about complete. I want to move on maybe to Southeast Asia, somewhere else. My son was just starting film school. And I thought this was in 2009. Let me bring my son with me to the Omo for one last trip. So he can do a little bit of filming, uh, and I can do a little bit of photography, say goodbye to my friends. And we did that. A few months later, Lolly got a visa to visit America. And we were overjoyed. Lolly came to America, he came to California to visit our, us and, and stay with us for a month or so. When he came, he told me the story. About me. And he told me that story because he was in a really rough spot. At that point, he had 24 children and he didn't have money to feed them or to, or to house them. He said, John, please, can you help? So, you know, of course, uh, you, can't, you can't say no to something like that. And uh, so I said, sure, Lolly, um, we'll do whatever we can. We'll plan the trip. So we immediately talked to my son, he got some of his buddies from film school, and, uh, and, and girlfriends, I might add, because one of our cinematographers was a young woman, she was very talented. And um, we, went, we went to the home, and we thought we'd make a YouTube video that we, we could put on the internet, and that YouTube video kind of kept going, kept going, and we thought, well, maybe a 20 minute short, this, this is starting to shape up into an interesting story. And all the time, we were doing it with the intent that we, we, we can tell this story to raise support for these children, because that's really what it's all about. And uh, five years later, we ended up with, with this film that we saw today. And it's still the same reason you know, we made the film to raise awareness, to raise support for Lolly and all the tribe. So that's so the amazing story. Uh, do you want to ask any questions, questions for the audience? Uh, this gentleman in the bottom. Yeah. Is the government doing anything about the water or anything else that they need? So the question was, the is there help from the government right now? You know, um, the government has very limited resources. We like the individuals who are in the government locally, but um, there's, a, there's, a, 
the Soma tree. Uh, in East Africa, in, in that part of the world these days, commercial, large commercial farming is coming in. So there's stress on land. Uh, dams are going uh, in a, a river that are impacting uh, the people. Those farms, those the commercial farming, things like cotton are being grown. Evidently, the world needs more T-shirts because that's all going to be exported. But the, the chemicals used for fertilizer or pesticides goes into that river. In fact, that river, which is about 400 miles long, dumps into the largest desert lake in the world called Lake Turkana. Just about 60 miles south of Deuce Village is the Kenyan border. And it, at that border, it becomes a delta and opens up into Lake Turkana. Uh, which is this magnificent lake where about a quarter of a million people uh, live around that lake, rely on that lake. So these chemicals going down have to help. But does the government help? They're sympathetic. They, um, they support us in all of our efforts. They appreciate what the Poland Child does there, what the Dolly's doing. But they really don't have the resources to do, to do anything. And some seem to be a motivation. I'll give you an example. In 2011, more kids died of measles than mania. But children at Duke's Village and Corcho and Lou still, today, have not been immunized from, from, from measles. And that is hard for me to understand. The Italian government, there's, in fact, I just want to mention two, two, two outside entities that are making an impact. One is the Italian government through their embassy in Annas. They're putting in a clean water project. In about five weeks, I will be back in the Omo, and we will be having a big ceremony to celebrate all three villages will for the first time have clean water. And that's a great thing. And it, the water will be pumped from the river with, by a solar pump. This is another great thing fuel to have to manage. The, the solar pump will pump the water to a large tank. That tank will use a natural root material to filter 60% of the chemicals, the pollutants in the water. And then the other 40% will be taken care of with chlorine and a, a mixture of chemicals that the engineers know to add. And so that, that will be a great thing. The, the second thing I want to talk about, government uh, involvement, <clears throat> David Usher. Does anybody know David Usher? The name. He's, he's your ambassador to to, uh, to Ethiopia. David Usher and his wife Erica Usher, the Canadian ambassador uh, to to Ethiopia. Angels. I, I can't say enough about them and about what they have done. Omo Child. This home has a water tank because of the. They have electricity because of the Canadian ambassador. They have enough toilets and showers because of the Canadian ambassador. So thank you, Canada. Um, I want to get back to the audience, but while we have your editor here, I feel like I should ask him a question, and that is, this is a five-year project. Could you talk uh, briefly about how you um, took up all of this footage and pieced it together so beautifully, I might add. Thank you. Such a well-crafted film. Thank you. Um, for John, as a novice filmmaker, and he was just documenting this, and he accumulated 700 hours of footage. And um, and there was footage that we didn't even know about. The footage that you saw Lolly uh, when he was riding his motorbike, he, he shot that on, by himself. Before any knowledge of a film or anything, he just thought about documenting it. And throughout, through the film was almost done, and we were six months probably close to finishing, and he told us that he had this cassette in his drawer. And we looked at it, and it was that footage. And it was this kind of magical moments as a documentary filmmaker, you'll find these things happen. And that was a rare foot find for us. It was almost like that diamond and rough because you actually got to see his first contact with a parent, with a, with a mother, to try to rescue the child. And it was unsuccessful, but it was an amazing start. And uh, through the process, it was 
we didn't want to have a narrator. We wanted to tell the story of the car, through the car, through Lolly as being a member. He ended it through the car. Don't, when government, they get involved, you saw it kind of mess things up a little bit. And, and uh, it was important for us to tell the story through their mouths, through their eyes. John sat with these people for hours and would talk to them, not about Minky, because Minky is not talked about. Lolly didn't even know until he was 15. Imagine John who comes in there with, you know, as an outsider and for them to open up to him. So he would sit patiently and talk about coffee, cows, goats, and then he would start to talk about that. So for me, I took all this footage and I had retranscript while I was editing. So that was that was tough to read while you edit and figure out this whole how but um, it was a it was a it was a love of mine and I had because we we are honored to tell this story to, to the public for the first time they heard about this drive and it was our responsibility to tell it correctly and uh, I hope we did it and I appreciate everybody being here and your support and votes do help these people I'll tell you that right now so thank you for getting here too. I, I, thanks man you said it well uh, I think really what we did my kids this came from our hearts it really did we, you know, it's not about anything to do with awards <laughs> and all that stuff. Really, it has to do with these children. And, and as I stand here before you, I'm, I'm nervous. Do I do? Am I going to present it well? Because we're speaking on their behalf. This is for their future. Our dream is that this film will get them the the support. This, these are rented houses. They barely have enough now to get by. And so. You know, this is how we thought we would tell the story of the world. Yeah, and uh, as you saw, this is continuing. There's a tribe in, uh, right next to them called the Hammer Tribe, which Lolly is trying to negotiate, but it's very difficult for him just to get there. Like, uh, Ken, it's eight hour trip and up terrain. And he, so this is ongoing. We were showing this at a, our a festival. During the festival, we got a text that they rescued another child. So this is continuing as we go, and hopefully one day we'll be. Done, and we'll talk about the past. Yeah, exactly. Matt. And to, to add on to what you're saying, um, that vehicle you see, that's still the only vehicle he has. There's 44 children now in the home. If they have to go rescue a child in the, in the hammer, that means 44 kids don't have any transportation. If there's a medical emergency or something in the home, there's there's risks there. So that's why we're. So I definitely want to just get one more question, and we're running a little time, but right here, so. I'd like to keep up to date with current affairs. And I've read in Africa that they're killing uh, uh, albino children for their body parts. How come I've never read about this case about Minky in the newspapers? So this is a question about why Minky hasn't traveled through um, Western media in the same way as other issues. Yeah. You know, this is such a remote place, it's so far from anywhere. Um, this is Southwest Ethiopia. The closest town is, you know, is 125 miles away from these villages. You've got the Sudanese frontier to the west. You've got the, the Kenyan frontier to the south. Um, until really, just about the time I started going there 10 years ago, there were very few outsiders. A few missionaries would, would come through, like the Swedish missionaries who took Lolly to school, but. Um, it's, it's very isolated, that's one thing. I can't speak for Canadian news and media, that in America, our news is very well edited and, uh, and, and formulated so that uh, you know, we don't always get all the news around the world. Um, so why, why it hasn't been reported before, I can't tell you, other than you know, it really it's came up. It's only in the last five years, even. When Lolly told me in California, that's probably the first time an outsider was ever told about. Wow. I, I, do we have time for one more? Can we do one more? Yes, okay, right, right up here. <laughs> Where, uh, well, you know, you spoke about the Hammer Tribe and
So the question. So this, this is a question about the government clearly is trying to regulate NGOs. How does a child operate in this difficult situation? It's case by case basis. That is the law. What you just described is, is, is the law in Ethiopia. However, exceptions are made. Omo Child is the only home for children. We don't call it an orphanage. It's the only home for children in southern Ethiopia. Everything else has been closed for the very reasons you speak of. Uh, Omo Child just received, renewed, their, they've got their five-year operating license renewed. So um, we're, we're, we're very blessed and, and happy that that law that you described didn't affect us. Unfortunately, it may have impacted your work and others, and I'm very sorry about that. I would say keep working and keep fighting, um, because good will always win out. I'm a positive thinker, and I'm, I'm an optimist, and I believe there's more good in the world than there is bad, and uh, the good people just need to get together and fight hard. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, thank you for sharing this amazing thing with us. We really appreciate it. Be sure to vote for the audience in order. Please do vote. And I, I do want to say one more thing about this festival and the people and the volunteers. What an incredible, we've been to a few other festivals. Nothing is like hot dogs. This is amazing. And we love Toronto. Thank you. Thank you.